Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Linguistics Career Launch panel session called Linguists in Nonprofit Organizations. My name is Alex Johnston. I'm the director of the Masters in Language and Communication program at Georgetown University in the Department of Linguistics. Today we have a panel of three linguists who all have experience working in nonprofit organizations. Our panel will be supported by Marcus Robinson, our program assistant. So I'm just going to take a quick minute to let you know who's with us today so that you can pin their video if you care to. We have with us Dr. Marissa Fond from Georgetown University. Dr. Fond is a sociolinguist who's worked in nonprofits, for-profits, independent consulting, the federal government, the Census Bureau, and now she's back in higher education as an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Linguistics at Georgetown University. So I like to say she's a quadruple threat. She's done it all, has had many comparative experiences in different types of organizations. I'm also happy to welcome Dr. Meg Monty. She is Director of Performance-Based Language Assessment at the Center for Applied Linguistics in Washington, DC. Dr. Monty leads test development, assessment research, and test validation projects. And she's particularly interested in technology-based speaking assessment. Dr. Monty holds a dual position at the Center for Applied Linguistics, and now at Georgetown University, where she's Associate Research Professor in the Department of Linguistics and Director of the Assessment and Evaluation Language Resource Center. And we have Minnie Cordy, who is the Senior Director, Impact and Innovation at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Washington, DC. And Minnie is also completing her dissertation in sociolinguistics at Georgetown University's Department of Linguistics. Writing her dissertation as we speak, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> it is. So I'm so happy to have these three linguists here who will let us know about what it's like to work at a nonprofit organization. And I'd like to just go back to you one by one and ask you to just flesh out your introduction a bit more with uh, some information about the nonprofit where you worked and a bit more about your background in linguistics and your training and what led you to work in that nonprofit organization. So I'll start with Marissa Font and then I'll go to Meg Monty and again to Minnie Cordy. So Marissa, do you mind letting us know just a bit more about your training in linguistics and what your role was in the nonprofit where you worked? Sure, thanks Alex and hello everyone. It's really great to see you today. Um, so my training in linguistics is, uh, I have a bachelor's in linguistics and Spanish from Smith College and a master's and PhD in linguistics from Georgetown University. Um, and I was able to work in different positions using my linguistics training after earning my bachelor's, after earning my master's, and after earning my PhD. So really, um, you know, there are opportunities uh, no matter what degree you may hold. Um, in terms of nonprofit, uh, the nonprofit where I uh, worked for a number of years was the Frameworks Institute in Washington, DC. Uh, Frameworks is a social science research nonprofit that aims to uh, do descriptive and then prescriptive research message development and testing to try to shift people's understanding about certain scientific concepts or social issues. Um, and at the Frameworks Institute, I was a senior researcher and the assistant director of research. But in addition to that, in my independent consulting, I've also worked with other uh, clients uh, who are nonprofits, but also for-profit um, companies as well. So as Alex uh, very kindly mentioned, um, I'm able to kind of speak to some of the uh, similarities and contrasts. So again, great to be with you today. Thank you so much, Marissa. Meg, I'd like to turn to you, please. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, just to echo the how glad I am to be here with you all. And um, as Alex said in my introduction, I work at the Center for Applied Linguistics. So I'll focus on that aspect of my kind of 
career story um, and how that relates to my background and training. And I think maybe I'm um, a little bit different in my uh, kind of trajectory in that I've really only ever worked um, at the Center for Applied Linguistics. Um, I started there as an intern in 2004 and realized that I loved doing this kind of work. Um, so I'm an applied linguist and my specialization is in assessment and testing. And um, I started there as an intern when I was a Georgetown master's student, not really knowing much about testing and assessment as an area of research and being a little bit skeptical about that, but um, came to really love and enjoy that work. And so I ended up getting a doctorate from Georgia State in applied linguistics, um, but really was doing that um, mostly while working or consulting um, at Cal. So I, I was getting that training in order to facilitate the work that I wanted to do um, in the nonprofit sector. And just to give you a little bit of, of background about the Center for Applied Linguistics, um, we're a private not-for-profit research in, institution located in Washington, DC. We've been around for over 60 years and we do work um, related to promoting linguistic and cultural diversity. And what that means just in a really practical sense is that um, we do grant funded work, although that money is a little bit harder to get, but we do some US government grants from um, US Department of Education. Um, we have some defense money because they tend to fund language initiatives. Um, and so we do quite a bit of assessment work, right? If you're familiar with sort of K through 12 education right now, right? Assessment is a really big part of that. So we work on assessment of languages, English and also world languages um, for K through 12 and adults. Uh, we also do a lot of professional development. So we have sort of contracts with states or school districts and we pro provide professional development. Um, but as an organization, we're really focused on taking linguistic theory and research and making that practical for people. So translating it into assessment tools, into classroom practices um, that are related to our mission. So that's kind of what we do and a little bit about where our funding comes from. Um, so in some ways we're a little bit unique, I think in the, the field, like you're not gonna go out there and find other centers that employ a lot of linguists, right? In the same way that we do, I don't think. Um, but, you know, there are sort of sectors that we're connected to. So if you're sort of interested in this kind of work, um, there's nonprofit and research institutes that would be more in the sort of general education area. Um, like American Institutes for Research here in DC. So th there's that kind of um, spot and, and they often have um, linguists there or have folks focusing on language learning as part of their work. Um, also sort of the government side of things. So um, Department of Ed, Department of Defense, um, NSA, those areas. Um, and, and then maybe sort of some like policy type think tanks would be sort of loosely in our orbit of, of um, organizations. So just to kind of help you place me and, and Cal into, um, into the world of working linguists. Thank you. That's a, a great way to situate yourself in that space. And by the way, could you remind me about how many employees Cal has? Is it about 60? We're currently at about 60. Yeah, we fluctuate anywhere from like 100 plus down to like, you know, 50, just really depending on funding um, over the years. So we'll kind of grow a lot if um, there's a boom in a particular area. And then as things shift, we, our staff might get a little smaller. So we're, uh, we're about 60 right now. Okay, great. Thank you. And Minnie, I would love to hear from you about your background in linguistics and what brought you to the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Washington. Yep. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, maybe I'll just say good day. It's so good to see some familiar faces and some familiar names for those of you who aren't on camera. Um, my name is Minnie Forte Anand, hopefully soon to be doctor, so I can join the ranks of uh, Marissa and Meg and Alex and the other uh, doctors on the phone. And hey, Nancy, I'm so glad you turned your camera on. Um, so clearly I've been around the block for a while. Um, I actually, this is my soon to be third degree from Georgetown. I uh, came to Georgetown uh, 20 years ago um, to study politics and government. And I did my first government class. And I was like, this is the, like, the worst thing ever. Who's gonna do this for four years? And so the next semester, 
I uh, was like, oh, I'll take a linguistics class. I didn't know what a linguistics was, right? And, um, but it didn't meet on Fridays and it was right next door to my, I think it was my English class or my philosophy class. I can't remember which one. And unbeknownst to me, I walked into Ralph Fassold's uh, intro to language class. And for the first time as a black woman, um, an African-American language speaker from the South, um, I felt linguistically, I felt linguistic pride. And I was like, wow, this, you know, six foot old white guy. And that's, and, and that's how he described himself. He's like, I'm a tall white guy, right? And for him to say that to me, but also give me this sense of like your linguistic, your, your linguistic variety is valid. You are valid. Like it really in this space where um, being, being black wasn't, you know, it was uh, Georgetown's, if you know anything about Georgetown, it's very not black. Um, and so to have that, and then also that my Southern draw wasn't broken, that my English wasn't bad. Um, I really was like, I dig this linguistics thing. And so then I, I got my undergrad degree in it. Um, and then I got a master's at Georgetown. And then I, I went to teach at Georgetown. So I actually left Georgetown and went to Michigan State because I was like, oh, well, you know, Georgetown's not going to hire me if I stay there. So let me leave. And I got to work with Geneva Smitherman, which was probably one of the best decisions. I, um, I'm so glad that I went to, to Michigan State before she retired and, and, and we've developed a lifelong friendship. Um, but then life happened. I had, a, I had a daughter who was very, very sick. And so I actually walked away from academia altogether. Um, and, and so uh, I actually got this job. One of my best friends used to be on the board at Boys and Girls Club. And he called me, he's like, I know you're trying to put your, I moved back in with my mom. He's like, I know you're trying to put your life back together and start something new. He's like, why don't you apply for this job in DC? Now, mind you, I'm in a small town in Georgia. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and I hadn't really worked a full-time job at that point. So the money was attractive, um, being back, you know, back in the, in the city that I, you know, loved while I was in college was attractive. So I applied, I ended up not getting the original job I applied for, but I ended up a couple of months later, actually getting the supervisor of the job I applied for. So, uh, it kind of worked out. And I think a lot of that dealt with my skill set, right. That I learned in the classroom and learned during my master's program and this kind of ability to do research and this ability to, Kind of think critically and write and so actually um it wasn't i didn't need to be in the 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 space of actually running the this facility i actually started to manage i managed six clubs at that point instead of just managing one and really thinking about the strategic vision of those six sites um and then so that was in 2012 i started working here so i've been in the nonprofit space um for nearly nine years november will be nine years um, and then I was like, I gotta go finish this PhD. And so I applied uh, to Georgetown a year and a half later and I got in. Um, and so now I am finishing, uh, hopefully very soon, a dissertation on uh, African-Americans in Washington, DC, looking at language change, but also how people talk about change um, as the city is shifting drastically. Um, and, uh, and I'll say this last little piece before I turn it back over to Alex, the other thing that's really, really interesting about being a linguist in, in this space is I didn't come into this space as a linguist. I came, I'm now bringing linguistics into this space. And it's a little different, right? So in some cases, people are hired as linguists for their job. I was hired in my job and now I use linguistics in my job. Um, and so I do a lot of framing and positioning and I work with our fundraiser, our fundraising department to really talk to and speak to stakeholders. Um, I make sure that uh, our management in the organization always has a story that's really that is relevant to whomever they're speaking to, right? Whether it's, so if you're an artist, I have a story about arts. If you're someone who's really big into technology, helping you, re it can be the same story, right? And we reframe that story to make sure that the funder feels connected to the mission and the work that we do. And so I've been doing um, that work for about nine years. And uh, recently I was promoted. So now I not only manage data, which is what I was doing initially, um, I manage as well STEM, arts, um, our virtual club, uh, Clubhouse at Your House, as well as our teen services and, and how we're really trying to reach out to teens, especially through social media um, and through uh, leadership opportunities. So Alice, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Minnie. And you've brought up so many important points. You know, first of all, the fact that although you weren't brought in and, and hired 
in your first job with the Boys and Girls Club, because you were a linguist, it really did hinge upon your, your, communi your communication skill set and how you communicate clearly, orally, and through writing. And that's something that we work on, you know, in our linguistics training. And we kind of normalize or naturalize that as something that, oh yeah, well, just all of us do that. But that's something that you can really leverage when you are interviewing and applying for jobs, because that is one of the number one things that employers want is, is clear and effective communication. And then also, Minnie, like what you say about, you know, you weren't brought in as a linguist, but now you're using linguistics to show and create value for your organization. You're sort of making that space where your linguistics skill set shines. Um, that's a really interesting thing that can happen when you're maybe the only linguist in an organization. So I'd love to build on that later in our discussion. So but keep that, that theme in mind as we keep talking. And that brings me to what I want to ask uh, Marissa and Meg is, you know, it, I think in your organizations, your linguistic skill set is what was sought for the organizations you were working in. Is that right? You know, how did they... Um, make use of your skill set as a linguist. Um, could I go to Marissa first and then to Meg, if that's all right? Sure. So um, the Frameworks Institute, um, as well as some of the other research nonprofits I've worked for as an independent consultant, um, have tended to look for social scientists, kind of flexible social scientists. So for example, at the Frameworks Institute, our research team uh, always included people with PhDs in sociology, anthropology, linguistics, um, political science, public health, um, lots of different uh, disciplines. And we, it was really important for us to play off of each other. So what disciplinary assumptions would we bring to the questions that we were asking? Um, and how could we, each of us, kind of grow um, as researchers through, um, you know, learning from our colleagues? So, um, you know, when I think about using my linguistics background in all of the roles that I've had, I think that it's important to both bring your, uh, your knowledge, your assumptions, your skills, and then also be very ready to be flexible in how you um, apply them. So I've certainly learned new skills in each role that I've had, um, in addition to building on the, on the training that I've, that I've had um, through my academic experience. So I think that that's something that's really important. So was my experience as a linguist sought? Yes, in a sense, um, but more broadly, um, my background in kind of social science and my ability to be flexible, I think was really important. Yeah, and that's a great way to label yourself or an identity that you can claim for yourself is social scientist because that will, uh, be understood by many different audiences. So often in job announcements for these types of research-based positions that are seeking, you know, social scientists who are in sociology, anthropology, or other, sometimes we are the other. So although it doesn't say linguist in that job announcement and in the description, we can jump in there because we can be social scientists. <laughs> we are trained in, in methods of social science, you know, qualitative and quantitative methods. And, and that's how we can kind of get an in and you know, claim that identity of social science and what we can offer that organization. So remember that as a way to uh, find yourself in job announcements that don't specifically mention linguist in many cases, please. Thanks, Alex. And can I can I just add, you know, in when I did my um, bachelor's in linguistics, I did psycholinguistics, child language acquisi acquisition, more experimental methods. For my graduate work, um, I focused on um, discourse analysis and sociolinguistics. So um, I should emphasize that, you know, the particular area of linguistics um, 
in which you have expertise would, would be relevant here. So if you're a phonologist, there might be other um, uh, types of keywords that you're looking for um, and the types of jobs that you are um, attracted to might be different. So I just wanted to add that little bit about my particular background as an applied sociolinguist. Thanks so much. Meg, I'd love to hear more about your career journey with Cal and how, you know, Cal Center for Applied Linguistics is an organization that advertises for linguists um, and attracts a lot of applied linguists. But what's so interesting is that you got your start as an intern, which is a, a common way to start out with a nonprofit organization. And then you also kind of developed your expertise in applied linguistics and in assessment as you went through. So can you talk more about your, your journey with Cal? Sure. Um, I'll talk maybe just a little bit about my own history in terms of gaining more, um, you know, sort of degrees and my sort of professional um, credentials that ended up being helpful for me. And then I can also talk a little bit, you know, I do a lot of hiring. So I can talk about like, what are the kinds of things we look for, either people who are explicitly from linguistics or maybe just trying to try to, you know, frame their own background and think about what skills are helpful. And so, um, you know, my work um, is kind of a combination. Now I'm, I'm a director of a program area. So I do content um, work um, and I work with content experts, but it's just a really good mix um, of technical skills and work um, as an applied linguist and also a ton of management work, budget, funding, people management, right? So I think when I, when I think about this question of what do, what do I bring as a linguist, um, you know, roles are always really complex and there's a lot of great things that I, I've gotten from my linguistic training and then a whole host of other things that I really had to learn on the job or from other sources about um, working in a nonprofit, working outside of academia um, that were very new to me. So as I said earlier, my story is sort of of being at Cal, right? And so I've had one, really just kind of one organization that's been a part of my story. And I ended up going to get a PhD um, with the goal of coming back and continuing to work in this sector, um, continuing to work in K through 12 education and in my specialty of language testing. So um, doing test development and research about that. So I knew that I needed some technical skills and training um, that a doctorate would provide, and also just um, the ability to get grants and to lead as a, um, a principal investigator and a project director. Um, having that credential of a PhD would help me meet those professional goals. And so that is um, what I went into my doctorate program wanting out of that, um, which you know I, I know is maybe a little bit more rare um, for folks, but for me that that was the case. And I really came to that conclusion because of the experience that I had working um, as an intern and then as a research assistant before I went into my doctorate. So for me, having just a little bit of time and space to work um, in a practical setting and to figure out what I liked and to just say yes to things um, was really helpful um, as I kind of built up where my interests were directed. And also I learned um, a lot from that experience of what kinds of jobs were possible. And um, it just, I tend to talk a lot about funding and money because in my career, that's just been really important in terms of what's possible, right? Is who is paying for it? Um, how are they paying for it? And what are their priorities? So I think that's just one reality of nonprofit work, of industry work is you always kind of have to be asking where the money is coming from. And that's what I tell people to ask a lot when they're interviewing is um, what are your funding sources? So um, let me just pick up the thread here. Yes, so that that's my background and training. And then I'll just talk a little bit about like specific skills that I look for when I'm working with linguists, content experts and hiring. Um, I think as an applied linguist, the real training that I got that's so useful is in systematic thinking um, and just proceduralizing things, right, and data analysis, um, the ability to kind of work out those plans and to apply that to problems um, and to set up systems that are going to be sustainable. 
And so that's the way that I train people to work on my team. And I think what um, having a background in testing in particular um, really gave me, because we're really big on logical frameworks, um, theoretical models that we then work out in practice and apply in real world situations. Um, and so, you know, if when I'm trying to talk to people about what my skills mean outside of um, linguistics, I'll talk a lot about those kinds of um, like systematicity um, structures um, that I'm able to put in place in a workplace setting. Um, but just totally agree um, with Marissa's point about flexibility. Um, I think that is just an absolute keyword when you're thinking about like transferring these skills uh, as something I look for when I'm hiring is just someone who has that mental flexibility um, to take those skills, apply them in new ways and work on a team. So um, I know that was a lot of information. I'm happy to follow up on any of that, but um, that, that's my kind of feeling from a hiring perspective. I so appreciate that you brought up the list of skills that you're looking for and name them in, ter in terms of systematic thinking flexibility, data analysis, proceduralizing. And I think, you know, making processes explicit and generalizable, um, I, those are all very important things to remember, kind of latch onto. These are some keywords that you can, you can use in an interview uh, with examples of results that you've achieved through those skills. And also thanks for, for mentioning how, you know, your work experience help to guide how you shaped your doctoral program. Um, I think that's something important to remember is that sometimes having that experience in the workplace will give you that, that focus uh, to, for your, your doctoral research and for your dissertation if you choose to continue um, and, and give you that sense of what can I do coming out of a doctoral program. Which is uh, something that that Minnie is going through right now, and and Minnie, I know that you know you were mentioning earlier about how you've used your linguistic skill set to. I think I think that played a role in your promotion, didn't it? Uh, when you were up for your promotion, could you tell that story, please? Sure. So, can you guys hear me? I think my headphones. Okay. Perfect, my headphones are going in and out. Um, I think a couple of things, I'm gonna back up a little bit before I talk about the promotion. Um, one of the things that, um, like I said, I didn't come into this role as a linguist, I wasn't hired as a linguist, um, but I think one of the things that has helped is um, it's given me entree into the community. So if you know anything about DC, you DC and, and maybe in other places as well, um, to be in these spaces, you need to be invited into those spaces. So um, DC is Chocolate City um, that's shifting, um, but even in these neighborhoods and these communities, um, you, you don't just get access to people. Um, and, and being here at the Boys and Girls Club gave me access to a lot of people, kids and their parents and then staff members who live and work and are natives of DC. Um, and so that has been really, really helpful. And the one thing I will say about nonprofits, and I can't speak to for-profits because I've never worked at one, but one of the things about nonprofits is a sense of community um, and this sense of that you belong to something, you're moving the mission forward um, as opposed to maybe the bottom line. And I'm not saying that that's a one way is better than the other, they're just different. So corporations and for-profits really are for-profit and not-for-profits. That's not to say they don't make money, but their focus is really whatever that mission is, is moving the mission. So our mission is to, you know, develop young people and give them, you know, beyond high school, what do they have a plan, making sure they're healthy um, and making sure that they're good people. They're just good citizens. They, you know, they vote, they don't litter. I mean, little things like that, that we can teach six-year-olds, that we do teach our six-year-olds. Um, and so I think that the nonprofit space has given me that access to community. And um, so recently when COVID hit, uh, um, I'll even back, let me back up one more time. Uh, I've also, because I didn't come in as a linguist and I came in, I was still a student. I was doing my doctoral program. Uh, Boys and Girls Clubs became my area of research. So when I was in my ethnography class with Dr. Trester, um, and many of you know her, um, she was teaching a class on ethnography. I actually did an ethnographic um, observation, ethnographic study semester long of my office and looked at women in leadership, 
specifically women of color in leadership. And I was able to, to do that. Um, and it was, it was really interesting to kind of think about this space from the research lens, as opposed to just from the actual being an employee lens. Um, and then I was able, um, my dissertation and my research focuses on stories from uh, African-Americans, uh, DC natives. And um, I had access to so many. So my colleagues then became uh, my, my colleagues then became uh, my interviewees, right? And so moving from me being as the subject matter expert in the data world, I came to them and asked them about life and they became the subject matter expert. And it created a different level of connectivity and connectedness in our office, I think, for those who were involved in the research project. And the reason that all of that's important is because when COVID hit, we had to kind of pivot and we had to think about um, our young people are at home. They're not connected to us. One of the things about Boys and Girls Clubs is that you're in a space, you're connected, you're building this community. And one of the things that uh, we did was create an online presence. And how did we, uh, so we took our, what we do in the club every day, um, right behind me, if you could see, uh, there's a gym full of kids running and I think they're doing tug of war right now, socially distanced tug of war. And it's actually a really cute sight um, to see. But one of the things that we did was because our kids couldn't be in our space, we brought, we brought them that Zoom, we brought them the club, um, the club feeling to Zoom. And um, and I know that sounds really silly, but what we did, we sent out packages. We said, hey, for this week have these materials. And then we led activities. We did games, we offered tutoring, we did STEM experiments, um, and we really tried to bring that space. But because people knew that I had ability to do research, because people felt like I was generally technologically savvy um, with uh, conducting interviews and being able to be in spaces with people and use technology, um, but also to critically think and, and visualize beyond just the moment. Um, and a lot of that is just your research skills that you learn in the classroom. Um, I think what we did is um, they're like, you know, many would be a great candidate to now lead this department, this department that's kind of made up of all of these various strands of the organization. So not only do I, you know, in some places you lead one specific thing. So you may lead the technology department, or you may lead the STEM programming, or you may lead, you know, data. So now putting all of these things underneath my umbrella really was because I was able to do qualitative and quantitative uh, work um, in my in my research, um, getting, you know, writing my dissertation and doing my PhD program. And so those things became under my wheelhouse. I was able to really help with strategic and um, and even tactical thinking because you have to kind of plan when you're when you're researching and and you are um, like Meg talks about uh, really using these um like really logically thinking and using evaluation um kind of that's how she got into her role you have to do the same thing and because i was in school and people knew that i was being successful there and i had gotten to um, that really helped when they were looking for candidates for this role i was i became one of the the front runners for the role because of the work i had already done not only the work i had done at the organization but the work that i was doing on the hilltop at georgetown um, in my doctoral program so just continue to do what you're doing and not necessarily so when you're if you're looking for a job specifically designed for linguists that's great find your keywords in your department your field but also don't limit yourself if you're if you know how to do research. If you know how to take data, interpret it, and then spit it out for others in a way that's palatable and manageable and legible for others, that's a skill. If you understand how to frame something in a way that makes sense for one group of people versus another group of people, if you understand how to position a company, how to position an idea, how to position um, um, a certain group of people, right? Those things are really, really important. And I'll give you one last um, piece of uh, one last piece of the story that I was telling Alex about the other day. So one of the things that we're moving away from is this idea that we have to, um, I can't even think of the word right now, but we have to have these sob stories. That's what we call them, right? It's everything has to be a sob story. Everything has to be a sob story. We always wanna pull at the heartstrings. I, you know, that's get people right to write checks and open their pocketbooks. But instead of simply saying, you know, at risk youth, right? Because that puts the onus on. So this is what I mean by positioning. And this is what I mean by framing. Instead of saying at risk youth, 
right? Because that makes it like the young person did something. That that gives agency. It puts the agency and the um, on the wrong on the wrong element. It's it's young people or it's, it's youth with adverse childhood experiences because it's no it's not their fault that they were in this situation, but because um, as a linguist I was able to kind of come in and help my company think about how we talk about these things. How do we how do we um, how do we make sure that we are setting our youth up not to be victims, but to be empowered. And language does that, and um, and so that's really uh, that's really kind of what prompted my promotion. Um, and it was a very and I, I'm glad that you know my research and and my ability to make these connections for people are really what gave me the um, what really propelled me. Thank you, Minnie. You've, you've brought up so many important points that I, I want to keep talking about, including this distinction between mission-driven and profit-driven, and also your, your final example of how you shifted the framing of the messaging to donors, to potential donors, in the development work that your organization does is, is really important. It's, that's a place where linguists, sociolinguists in particular perhaps, can, can find a way to add value to an organization is to rethink the metaphors that are being used in the messaging to different audiences. And um, I, I know that uh, Marissa has done some work in that area as far as looking at the words that are used in differentiated messaging. So if you, if you have other examples of that, uh, Marissa, and some of the work that you've done, please feel free to, to bring that up. Because um, that's, that's very important when you're communicating with uh, all of the different stakeholders and potential donor groups. Sensei. Yeah, I think I would just say that um, Boys and Girls Clubs are, the organization is really lucky to have many because a lot of organizations will work with an organization like the Frameworks Institute to do exactly that kind of work. So um, framing messages, whether to donors, to community members, to um, uh, policy makers is something um, that Frameworks will do because a lot of organizations don't have that expertise on staff. Um, so yes, exactly, that's, um, that's the kind of work that um, we would do on our research team. So trying to figure out, okay, well, when people hear at-risk youth versus um, another um, name or descriptor, what, what do people think about or what does that mean to them? What ideologies does that cue for them? Um, and so, um, you know, I think that um, as more organizations start to realize the value of this kind of work, perhaps more organizations will have that expertise on staff as they do um, with many in leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, in, instead of only, um, you know, working with an outside organization in order to do that work for them. Uh, so I think that that's, yeah, a really important point. Yeah, Minnie is the, the in-house uh, leader who can provide that uh, type, of, type of work for the organization. I, I know we have a question coming in from chat and as we go through, please feel free to put all of your questions in the chat. I'd like to get back to talking about skills and, and what uh, hiring committees and hiring managers are looking for. So, Several presenters are explaining to us that we have relevant skills. It's the question in the chat, which I think many of us understand. I wonder, however, if they could provide any insight on how hiring managers or committees might be convinced of our value to their organizations. And, and Meg and then Minnie, I think, may have responses to this question. Sure, I, I can kick us off because um, I do a good amount of hiring at all different levels. Um, so I think the way that you might think about this is probably really different if you're coming in, you know, at a sort of what we would call a research assistant sort of out of undergraduate versus master's versus doctorate, right, where you have different levels of technical training. Um, but I think if, if you have sort of um, maybe if you're looking at the more entry level, right, um, kind of role, 
I think what I look for there even more than particular skill sets are again, going back to that idea of flexibility, right? So it's that idea of making connections between the things that you've done um, and the things that I'm looking for, which are always, you know, at a good organization, right? That knows what they want. They're gonna have a pretty good job ad um, that should lay out the kinds of skills um, and role, uh, role functions that they want this position to fill. And so that our ability to make those connections for me is always really important um, so that I can see that someone is able to transfer skills. Um, so I look for that. Um, I would say at all levels, um, I really look for people who are um, interested and willing to learn, right? Because we all come in with a certain way of doing things um, and training that's very useful. Um, but at any organization, you're gonna need to learn a lot. And so that kind of, um, orientation towards learning um, and the ability to learn well um, is something that I think can come out in a good interview um, and is important to me personally. Um, and then I'll say this one thing that I often find is hard because I, I do a lot of hiring out of academic contexts um, is that in an academic context, you're often trained to work very independently. You do your assignment, you get a grade, um, and it kind of ends there. And I find that bridging um, the collaborative work in a nonprofit context can be difficult if you're sort of in that um, independent mindset, at least for the, the work that I do. And so um, people who can talk about experiences working collaboratively um, and also sort of um, what they might bring to a collaborative process, how they take feedback, um, those kinds of things, which you can get those experiences academically, um, but I think you're not always sort of like honed in on them or they, they don't always jump out because they're, they're not valued in the same way in academic context in my own experience. Um, so that sort of um, sense of how you're gonna fit into a team, work with others and take feedback from other types of experts or, or people who have different perspectives um, is one of my, my very top things. Great, thank you. And I think Minnie, you were gonna jump in on this too and you're position is higher in hiring people. Yeah, so unlike Meg, I don't hire, for the most part, like no one from academia, right? Like that's not who we are looking for. Um, generally, most of our positions are community members. There are some like more research focused positions, but one of the things I will tell you as a tip more generally is under, use your research skills to research what you're going after. So if you're going after a position that um, you're gonna be focused on, uh, I'll talk about the one we just hired for uh, two, uh, a month ago um, about teen advocacy, understand what that means, understand the landscape of the space that you're trying to enter. So one of the young ladies, she was from New York and we asked her about DC and she couldn't really tell us about DC. I think it's really, really important to understand where you're trying to go, um, whether that be geographically, whether that be the type of organization or the type of corporation, understand where you're, like Meg said, that team you're trying to fit into, but understand not only your job, but kind of how that job fits into the organization, how that job fits into the city, or if it's in a virtual remote space, how that job interacts with others. Because if when people, and it comes out very clearly, and, I, and this sounds really simple, but it's not. Um, when people come in and they don't understand what they're applying for, and, and, and I don't mean like, yeah, they know they apply for job 3752B, right? But then understanding what is 3752B? What is the director of teen programming and advocacy? What does that mean? What are you going to be doing? In what space are you? You're in, you're in the nation's capital. So what does that mean as versus us being in Iowa? Um, and then the other thing is, is writing. And one of the things is all of us in the academic space, we write. So one of the things that I would suggest you doing um, is most jobs will not require, mm, that's not true. Depending on where you are applying and what level you're applying, there will be a writing sample. For me, I do I do live writing samples. So I want people to, I don't want you to submit something because I could ask Alex to write it for me or I could ask Marissa to heavily edit this and I don't get a sense of what you've written for me. Um, so one of the things that I ask people to do is come on and I'll give them a prompt and they have to write in, they have 60 minutes to write toward this prompt. The reason that you want to do that is because then you start to see skills. So what I'm going to challenge you is when you apply for a job and you really want that job, take 
give yourself about an hour and look at one of the bullets in the job ad and say, hey, let me look at bullet three. Um, let me write a prompt that will be something that's relevant to bullet three or bullet four. Because if you can write about the job, then that, um, that shows that you understand it. And if you, if you feel overwhelmed in that process in that 60 minutes, then maybe you need to do some more research. And so these are very practical things that you can use. And I, and I know we're not, you know, because I'm not telling you to use your, it's important to use your, whatever you learn in your applied class, whatever you learn in your sociolinguistics class, whatever you learn in your computational, as far as the subject matter, but how you come off as a candidate for a position, how you relate to how you, how you sell yourself in that interview or in that uh, application process, a lot of that is beyond, it's not simply about understanding, you know, natural language processing or understanding sociolinguistic theory. It's really about understanding how and what hiring managers are looking for. That's what I found in my experience. So some of these skills that you do every day, you're writing every day, you're researching, make sure you do those things and prepare for the interview, just like you wouldn't go into your phonology test without preparing, or you wouldn't go into your oral exam without preparing. Prepare for the job interview the same kind of way. And I promise you'll have more success than if you did not um, have some of that preparation. Thank you, Minnie. And you're doing a brilliant job of foreshadowing some of our other offerings coming later in the linguistics career launch where we will talk about how to prepare for your job interview and make use of exactly these types of strategies that Minnie is telling you about. So for example, taking those bullet points from the job announcement, if you can write a star story about those bullet points, that will really help you to answer questions within your interview. And again, the star story we've covered in resumes, we'll talk about it again in interviews. It's the situation task action result framework, which gives you a really short, effective way to present some results and show that you know what the job entails because you're trying to match what you have already accomplished with what the job wants and is asking for. Yes, and how you, as Minnie saying in chat, how you add value. I would love to get into kind of the impetus for putting this panel together and some of my thinking behind, you know, why we needed to have a linguist and nonprofit organizations panel. Part of the reason uh, that I, I wanted you to, to come today is to talk about some of the pros and cons about working in nonprofit organizations and, and let us know about how the structure of those organizations affect your, your roles and how the nonprofit functions in the world. You know, Meg has already hinted at, look at the funding structure, look at where the money comes from. And this panel is important because many students who are looking for careers beyond academia and often tell me, I want to work with a nonprofit organization because they do have this idea that nonprofit organizations are mission focused, will align with their values, are, are ways that students uh, you know, and later as, as uh, job holders can advance social justice issues. So I'd like to get at the differences between uh, the not-for-profit and the for-profit organizational structures and how meaningful that is. Um, so I wonder if, if Marissa, if you might have some, some thoughts about this. Sure, Alex, that's a big question and I'll do my best, but folks, if you have questions, put them in the chat, please. Um, so, you know, I think it is so important if you're considering working for an organization, be it a nonprofit or um, for government or for uh, a for-profit um, organization, to look at what the organization is as an individual organization, because um, Boys and Girls Club, Cal and Frameworks Institute are very different nonprofits. And so again, you want to look at the mission statement of the organization, but also you might want to look at, as has been mentioned, this is, I agree, so important, um, the funding. So where does the money come from? Does it come from individual donations? Does it come from large philanthropies? Does it come from government, local, federal? Um, you also um, might want to look at the organization's 990, which will tell you um, details about the highest compensated employees at that organization, as well as how they're spending their money. 
So for nonprofits, that's uh, a resource that's available to you. Um, you also um, might want to look at uh, a resource uh, that might be of interest to you is Nonprofit Quarterly, which is um, a uh, publication that kind of um, publishes voices in the nonprofit space and uh, issues that the um, sector is grappling with. And the reason that I think it's so important to look at the organization specifically is that, you know, having worked for all different types of organizations, you know, I can tell you that a lot of times it really depends on the size of the organization, the management structure, um, the types of uh, partners or clients that the organization might have. So I've worked for um, organizations that are technically for profit that do really interesting and important um, social research um, that you might associate more um, with the mission of a nonprofit. And I've also worked for nonprofits where, um, you know, we, we, the employees might have questions about whether or not a particular project actually does further the mission of the organization or whether a funder, um, you know, is um, the type of partner that we want to have. Um, so again, I think that, you know, as you're looking at organizations, I would look at them as individuals using all of these resources um, as guides, because you might find that you don't want to limit yourself. You might find that you, you know, might actually want to work for um, a private for-profit organization because the work that they do really speaks to your, um, your values and your skills. Um, and you might find that that's not always true with every nonprofit that you encounter. And then from there, I would say that you will notice some cultural differences in terms of, um, you know, how an organization thinks about money and particular, um, you know, uh, financial concerns, um, how they're able to, uh, hire people, how nimble they are in terms of, um, you know, the work that they do, you know, who are they beholden to is really important. Um, so again, I, I think that there are important uh, differences you might perceive between nonprofits and for-profits, government um, on a large scale, but in your search, I would definitely look at the, um, at each organization and each role as kind of a, a unique um, opportunity that you should consider considering. Thank you so much, Marissa. There is such diversity among structure, funding source, uh, and mission among nonprofits as for for-profit organizations. And you know, as I was telling Marissa earlier, remember as she knows, <laughs> remember that the National Rifle Association is a nonprofit organization. Actually, they were classified as a 501c4 organization, meaning it was a social welfare organization, right? So that's a tax status. You want to look beyond the tax status of whether an organization is, is nonprofit, social welfare, or for profit, and really get at what where's the money coming from, how are they using it, how they're organized, and many more factors to see if it's a really good fit for you or not, both values-wise and mission-wise. Meg, I think you might have something to add here about, about funding and money and organization. Um, sure, I, I think I'll just talk a little bit about, just in my experience, um, how working at a nonprofit in terms of um, how we get money has shaped my role. Um, and, and what I like about that, um, just, you know, this, this may be of interest because I think I do feel really fortunate to be a working linguist um, and to have that be an explicit part of my job. And I would say the percentage of my day where I'm doing linguistics is often pretty small, right? Um, just this could depend on how your own career shapes up, but um, I discovered from working more on the research side of things that I loved management um, and I loved working with people. And I also loved um, 
the development side of things. And th this really is not for everyone, but you know, working in so soft money where you have to bring in grants and contracts um, in order to facilitate your mission, right? Um, so we, we're mission driven at Cal in that everything we do is focused on developing linguistic and cultural diversity in the US and the world, um, which is kind of a pretty big mission, but our particular projects are, um, except in a very few cases, really um, ex externally funded or um, are sort of solid sources of revenue that are sustainable. So we are very careful about what we can do. Um, and it shifts, right? As politics change, as priorities change within the US over time, the areas that we work in um, can change quite a bit. Um, and so for me, I find that um, the process of going after grants, of working with clients and translating what we do into things that might meet their needs, solve their problems and issues, um, I just find that really exciting. Um, but I, I would say, um, you know, there's some, um, the, again, depending on a lot of factors, right, your organization at size, right, it's, um, you know, there's some sort of lack of security there, right, in that type of work where um, my job next year is depending on how good I'm doing this year on these development aspects. Um, and for other folks at my organization, you know, this is not a part of their work in the same way that it is for mine. Um, that's just been kind of part of preference and the way that my career has, has evolved. But um, I just personally find that as a really um, exciting part of, of work is writing grant proposals, um, talk, talking with clients. And so I think if you have interests along those lines, um, there are lots of jobs where that's very relevant and, and can be a big part of nonprofit work. Um, and, and I think for everyone, what I tell my team is that everything we do is development, right? Um, because of the quality of our deliverables of our client work is always ensuring our future work. Um, so just, just sharing a little bit of sort of the mindset that we have um, and how you kind of balance mission and this, um, you know, sort of funding and money aspect of, of nonprofit for me. Great, thank you. And I, I do have a question that came in from the chat, unless many of you would like to add in something about funding and then I'll go ahead with our, our chat. Um, one. I can just briefly, so I, I agree. I think every person, um, although you have a, a formal resource development team, right? So we have a chief development officer, we have you know people who focus on individual giving grants, et, et cetera, et cetera. I think every role is a, uh, a development role in the sense of every person, you know, when I go out and I talk about the data, um, I'm helping to, to establish the need for funds. You know, everybody has their different role and um, different roles will be funded differently. So some of them are, you know, based on grants that you receive. Um, some of them are based on individual donors who specifically, that's one of the things we're dealing with right now, who specifically name the things that they want their money to go to. Um, and, and if you don't deliver, then they can pull their funds, right? Or they don't renew their funds. And so these are things that are very much a reality of the nonprofit world, not in the same way that you see in for-profit, right? Um, understanding funding, however, if you're in a very stable organization, generally you won't see, well, we had to, you know, let go of 57 people because this contract ran out. Generally, most contracts, if you're if you're hiring this substantial amount like that, it's very it's, a, it's usually a long-term contract. It's usually a long-term relationship. Now, sometimes things do happen. COVID happened, life happens, you know, the, the funder dies. Um, and, and the people who then deal with the money and deal with their estate and deal, you know, they decide that they want to go a different direction um, if there was an explicit instruction. So those things happen. But for the most part, um, make sure that you do understand if, if you... Um, if you are in these positions, are they funded by a specific time source? So we have to like sort of some positions we have, we have a, a temporary position and you have to state that this is a, this is a, a term of a term funded source. So at the end of three years or at the end of two years or contingent upon results in year one. So people will be aware. So just always look out for those things. And then once you are, you know, in the negotiation stages, I wouldn't say asking your first day of your first interview, but if you get offered or you're getting 
further along in the interview process, you can ask about the funding for that specific position or for that project because it's it's really it's really important um, because you you want to know that if I'm leaving a great job that I know I have security but I want to do something else but in six months there's not going to be this new something else that I'm applying for that may not be the step you want to take um, so just you you can't ask those questions um, tactfully don't be like hey give me some uh, tell me what's the 411 on this contract that may not be the way to go but there's always ways to talk about money in, in ways that your employer or your future potential employer won't feel alarmed that you know oh this person's you know going to come and try to bug the system thanks so much Minnie. i have a question that i'm going to direct first to meg monty since you have to hop off at about 10 minutes past the hour we have until about 15 minutes past the hour this is a great question that applies to all of us here uh, myself included. Many of the panelists have transitioned from academia to nonprofit back to academia, which is counter to what I've heard about entering academia later, which is that it's difficult to re-enter academia after you've left. Do you think it's easier to make that transition back to academia in DC versus in other cities? Meg, how would you, how are, how are you responding to this one? Yeah, well, it's, it's funny. I'm in the middle of a somewhat similar transition um, in that, you know, as I've said from my story, my purpose was really always to work in assessment and nonprofit work um, and not in an academic context. But um, just this past month have taken a dual role where I'm um, part-time at Cal and part-time at Georgetown as an associate research professor. and. Um, would have said, you know, that transition, you know, in the past, um, it doesn't really often go the other way, right, from industry or nonprofit back to academia. Um, so this was a surprise to me um, and a very happy one. I'm very glad to work at Georgetown. Um, but in my role, I am running a grant funded Department of Ed Center within the linguistics department. Um, and I have a non tenure line one year contract you know, just to, just to share the personal details, which I don't mind doing. So it's not that I have transitioned from a nonprofit into a tenure line position. Um, and, and I'm not sure really how possible it would be for me to do that um, if, if I wanted to, just given the choices I've made in my career. So um, I think that um, as the academy changes, and I'm sure there's people here who can talk even more about that um, in knowledgeable ways, but you know, some of those boundaries are porous, but I think um, the particular roles that might be available, um, you, you know, probably are look really different. Um, and I do say just, I know this was a DC specific question. Um, I always just think DC is a great place to be a working linguist. Um, it's, it's a wonderful city for opportunities and there's lots of roles, um, particularly on the government side. Um, for people. So I, I, yeah, I do think here um, we're just really lucky to have um, a lot of great higher ed institutions and nonprofits, government agencies, and, and there's a lot of relationships between those that I think um, make for a lot of opportunity just in my own experience. So thanks so much, Meg. And if you need to hop off and prepare for your next meeting, it was such a pleasure to have you. Really grateful to you for sharing your expertise with us today. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks so much. And, you know, Marissa, I'd like to direct that same question to you because you've done so much transition among different types of organizations. And I'd love to hear from you how you manage that. And, you know, was it just that opportunities presented themselves? Did you seek these? How did you figure out your next step and that, you know, led you to working in a different type of organizational structure? Sure. I mean, um, I can certainly um, empathize with this question. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that I decided to do graduate work at Georgetown um, and, and not at other institutions, um, it was a tough decision at that time, a number of years ago now. But one of the reasons that I decided to come to Georgetown was that the Georgetown Linguistics Department not only has a lot of um, people in its orbit that do work in a lot of different sectors, but the department is friendly to that um, kind of uh, goal that one might have, um, I think for the most part. Um, and so I was always keeping an eye on opportunities that would exist outside of academia. Um, 
And in terms of transitioning back to academia, I'll echo what Meg said in that, um, you know, my position at Georgetown is also non-tenure line. Um, I have no intention, um, you know, if I leave Georgetown, I have no intention of um, going on the academic job market. Um, I would much prefer to continue doing the work that I've been doing all of this time. That's why I also um, continue to do independent consulting to kind of um, keep those muscles strong, so to speak. Um, because again, I'll go back to that point about flexibility in terms of you know, thinking about um, you know, making connections among all the different types of work that you do. So in my classes, I often bring in examples from work that I've done outside of academia. Um, I talk about how we can use the skills that we're learning in context outside of the assignments um, that I've planned for the class. Um, and I've seen my students do this. Um, I can tell you um, a class that I taught this spring, um, a student who was working for a nonprofit actually as an intern um, developed um, a way to uh, frame onboarding materials differently. So the class was metaphor and social change. We were talking about how you frame um, you know, um, aspects of what an organization does, very much like what Minnie was talking about um, in much more detail. Um, and she presented that to the executive director who decided to incorporate it into the onboarding materials. And so I think that there are a lot of connections to be made among all these different types of work. And if you look for those connections, you can only make your, yourself stronger as a candidate. Um, and so, you know, I think that would I, with, with my experience, find it difficult to, um, to go on the job market looking for a tenure track role in linguistics? I would find that difficult because a lot of the writing that I've done has been proprietary or my name isn't attached to it. You know, that is uh, one of the features of, uh, of a lot of this type of work. Um, and that is very different from what academia expects. And so, yeah, I don't wanna say that there aren't options there. It really just depends on what your goals are and how you want to you know, live an academic life um, and potentially uh, an industry or nonprofit life as well. Thanks so much, Marissa. And you know, funnily enough, uh, I came to this position, non-tenure line contract-based position at Georgetown directly from a nonprofit role as a director of communications and chapter relations at a international education association. And I, I share some of Marissa's uh, thoughts and perspectives here that, you know, that's a that's the type of position that I, well, I prefer that position within academia, within my current context in a department that is friendly to preparing students for these types of roles and that has existing connections with industry and, and connections I'm shaping between the department and industry. So you really have to consider what role within academia will support what you want to do. And I know that we have just about uh, four minutes left for some final words from our remaining panelists. If you, and for any last questions from the audience, feel free to put up your digital hand or write a question in the chat. And I do recommend, I want to second the suggestion in the chat that if you are interested in certain organizations, whether they're nonprofit or for profit, subscribing to their newsletters, their email blasts is a great way to learn about what's going on in that organization, what their, their voice is, what their, their position is in the space that they occupy. That's a great way to learn more and to be able to position yourself well if you ever choose to apply to a position with that organization. It's a great way to keep tabs on different organizations that might be of use to you later. So thanks Marcus for putting our feedback survey in the chat. The short name for this session is nonprofits. We really appreciate your feedback. We always read it as soon as the results come in. And I would just like to give Minnie and Marissa like 
final words of advice for people listening about working with nonprofits, finding those jobs, interviewing for those jobs, anything you'd like to leave us with? I, I think my piece of advice would be, um, and this is something that I'm dealing with, is don't underestimate the power of the skills that you have. Right, you may not have written and published 17 articles and, and written seven books and all of that, but you have a lot of skills and, and really start to list out the things that you've done. And, and one of the things that I do, even in this professional development that I'm working with one of my, um, I'm kind of informally her mentor, I tell her to take your current resume, take whatever job you're looking for and create a spreadsheet. And if you like, okay, I have, you know, I worked at Target. I was a customer service manager. Great. Now you're looking for a position in which you're going to be dealing with, I don't know, let's say you're going to be dealing with um, an organization and you're going to be focused on, you're going to be a director. How has dealing with those customer service issues prepared you to be a director? And really in your spreadsheet, like line up those things and say, here's, here's thing one that I've already done. And here's how it lines to those that I have that that the job is asking for. And then what you do is you find out the spaces where you have the gaps and you go back in your experiences to say, okay, I know this is not on my resume, but have I done anything where I have to, you know, um, interpret data and write a report? Probably, probably you've done that, right? In your stats class or um, when you were in your sociolinguistic variation class, whatever the space may be. So find those spaces and find those opportunities that you can line up with what's already on your resume, what's on the job ad that you're looking for, and then where the gaps are. Um, because you'll be surprised, you actually probably have more of those skills than you, than you think you do. And, and that would be my one piece of advice. And then, or my, and my second one is, don't pin yourself in a don't pin yourself in a box. So just because it doesn't say linguist or it doesn't say you know uh, analyst or it doesn't say storyteller, there may be other ways that you can incorporate those skills. So really try to diversify and expand your reach and 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 kind of your your magnet like your magnifying glass of positions that you're focused on because you may find something that wasn't necessarily what you were looking for but it has everything that you can do and everything that you're already doing. So really make sure not to limit yourself in, in the types of jobs that you're interested in. You can limit your mission if you're specifically focused on young people or rifles or turtles or whatever it may be, right? So, but look into those positions and then start to look at different opportunities within, that, within those types of missions. Thank you, Mindy, for providing some really concrete strategies that you can use to, to align your experiences, paid or unpaid, with the bullet points in a job announcement. That was, that was excellent. Thank you so much. And you're, you're giving us all hope about you know, not, not boxing ourselves in. Um, Marissa, do you have any last words of advice to leave us with, please? Uh, Certainly, all of my advice really echoes Minnie's, um, both um, the advice you just gave now, but also earlier in our time together today. Um, I, I want to strongly agree with how important it is when you're interested in an organization or looking to apply to a job to do your research on the job and the organization. Um, so for example, um, I also, before I, launch into my example. I also want to um, say how this connects with that question about how do you, um, you know, make your skills relevant to a potential employer. Uh, the question was in the chat earlier. Um, so for example, the Frameworks Institute makes uh, available um, the vast majority of their reports. So uh, you can go on the website and read reports uh, in an issue area of interest to you. And so if you read a report and really absorb it, make notes on it, think about um, questions that you might have for an interviewer potentially, that demonstrates, so if, if I'm interviewing you, that demonstrates to me that you've said, okay, I care about what this organization is doing and how they're doing it. I am centering them rather than me. And so if you read a report, you could say something like, 
um, oh, you know, I read that you uh, conducted a survey with, with this many people at this time. Um, what platforms do you use? Um, I conducted a survey using Mechanical Turk that allowed us to have a turnaround time that was, um, you know, particularly fast and allowed us to do a lot of iterative um, testing of this uh, concept that we were interested in or something like that. Forgive me, I'm making up this example on the fly. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that allows you to say something about your own skills, but making it relevant to what the organization is already doing. So if I just randomly tell you about my dissertation, that's not super interesting uh, to an organization. That's more about you, um, not about them. But there are these ways that you can practice um, trying to suss out what the organization uh, needs, what the position requires, and plugging in little concrete examples about things that you've done, things that you've tried, um, knowledge that you have, whether about um, you know, uh, particular types of um, analysis or um, tools that you know how to use or experiences that you've had um, interpersonally um, that could be really, really um, relevant uh, for the person who is um, you know, evaluating you as a particular uh, you know, team member. Um, so I would really encourage you to, um, to kind of make use um, of the resources that are already um, available in an organization. And that includes following them on LinkedIn so that if they put out something new, you're on it. Um, sometimes you might need to plan ahead because a lot of for-profit organizations um, might require that you kind of submit your email to get the report that you want to read. So just be aware of that kind of thing. Um, and really, um, as many uh, said, do that research because um, it will make you so much more attractive uh, to the organization, no matter your field of linguistics that you've studied. So yeah, um, there is a lot that you can do to really position yourself um, as best as you can. On those inspiring notes from both Marissa Fun and Minnie Cordy, I just want to thank you so much for joining us in this panel, Linguists in Nonprofit Organizations. Thank you. Mm -hmm.